who made a living in Livermore in the 1950s or earlier. Uh, what was that? What was the business? Well, how did they make a living? Me? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, they were uh, farmers and then business people, plumber, uh -huh. great. teachers. Okay. And George? Uh, my dad worked a lot. Okay. And that started in uh, 1952. Um, so, okay, yes. And how about you? I did for work in the 50s, Dad. I was in construction. Uh huh. And what's your last name? Jansen. Oh my gosh. J okay, Jansen. Okay. Oh. oh, you did. Yeah, you built a lot of homes, huh? And you too, obviously. Okay, anyone else in uh, his family? Carol. Me. <laughs> Livermore, Carol. Livermore, yeah. Okay. I, oh, that's true. My dad was from Livermore. I had the Livermore office. Okay. Yeah, yeah State Farm. State Farm I'm sure a lot of the old folks were um, insured by her dad. Um, okay. Now, how many of you would remember the rivalry between Amador and Livermore? Oh. Oh my goodness. Boy, without something. That was before Granada, you know, came, right? And before Foothill and Pleasanton. Boy, yeah. I mean, I remember going with my girlfriends and making a big A in the Livermore football grass before the football game. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I'm curious, how many of you came here uh, because of the lab? Lawrence Livermore or Sandia? Okay. It's interesting. Okay. Well, you know, we're all connected. I mean, I know that we were Pleasanton and Livermore were once big rivals, right? But um, uh, Mr. Finn here told me when I, he contacted me and said, do you know how many people Livermore you're, you're related to? And Augie, my dad was a rancher, farmer. We had 800 head of Hereford and a lot of uh, row crops. And Augie Hageman's property and our property, the Moors, M-O-H-R, Connected, so I was always going over with my dad to see Augie Hageman, and Augie gave my dad a, I don't know, a uh, doggy that climbed up the trees, and you know. Anyway, we were really well connected. Um, so um, I want to introduce. Oh, let me tell you how the book started. You want to know that? Okay. So this lady over there, Judy. Judy, stand up. Not raise your hands. I saw her for a, maybe a period of four or five years, and she she knew I had written a book uh, that did real well on Amazon, and and then I had been here forever, my family, and so then she said, Donna, everybody wants to know stories. We have books on facts, but they want to know stories. And so she didn't give me a time that she thought would be good. And finally I said yes, she was really persistent. And I think it was right before COVID or when COVID was starting or something. And um, I knew I'd have to be in the house and I could be on the phone. And so I said, sure, but Judy, I really want to do the 50s. And I am so glad, and because uh, because of the 50s, we have 38 people that I interviewed in that book and all of the uh, videos are in the museum, and um, anyway. Uh, and we've already sadly lost four people, probably five, because one of the women, I can't get through to her, and she retired in San Jose. So uh, I really encourage you to think about doing this project. It is the most worthwhile project, because it means so much. I went to a funeral for one of the ladies, her name is Gail, and um, Gail Lund, yeah. And they mentioned how much she loved being involved in the book seven times in her, uh, in her funeral, her, her uh, celebration. So um, anyway, so if I cough, I don't have COVID. I have this cough that they can't get rid of. So the only thing I can do is what my grandmother told me never to do, and that's chew gum. So if you see me chew gum, it just stop my cough. Welcome. Okay, so um, anyway, so I started interviewing people, and then I happened to be friends with um, the Shots, 
Uh, does anyone know Wayne Schatz? Oh, you do, okay. Well, I'm friends with him and his, he and his wife, and he heard about the project. Donna, you gotta go. Best writer I ever had, and he was very high up physicist, is this Lauren DeVore. And I thought, well, you know, I guess I'll go talk to her, but, you know, he, she wrote for Wayne, who was a physicist, and I thought, I want stories, casual stories. But I met her, and oh my goodness, she told me that her favorite job, besides working for Wayne Schatz, was to ghostwrite for Edward Teller. She learned how Edward Taylor, uh, Teller communicated, you know, how he had one day would be yelling, one day would be loving everyone, and he trusted her, so she wrote his correspondence. She loved it. She loved understanding how people communicated. And I thought, oh, I've struck gold. And she didn't, no one worked for money. We didn't pay her. She, she believed in the project. Then she brought another writer from the lab, and then she brought one of the top graphic designers who de designed the whole book. And you'll notice the print is a little bit larger, you know. Anyway, so I just thought it was amazing. And then also we had a volunteer editor, and she's in the back there. Her name is Lynn Muller. When I interviewed her, uh, Lynn Muller is scared. When I interviewed her, she told me her, what she had done and that she had edited a lot of educational um, materials publish, for publishing. And I thought, well, I'll wait till I talk to her after she's done with the interview. And she said, sure. So she edited uh, the whole book. Now you'll notice in the book that there's no colons and semicolons. And when I interviewed people like Carolyn, who was a teacher, and Marin, who was a te retired teacher, and others, they said, oh, Donna, that's, it should be a colon or a semicolon. I said, no, this is a casual conversation. But they finally went along with it. So, um, and, but I was worried about not getting everyone's story, and I knew that would happen. That's one of the reasons why I hesitated. And sure enough, you know, there's some people that are upset that I didn't get their family stories, but, I mean, it's 300, almost 400 pages, you know. So I tried to get, like, a rancher, farmer, a dairyman, a small business people, politician, and a, a wonderful family, the Macias family, who worked so hard for a lot of the farmers. So it was a wide range, which I think is really neat. It captures the people that made a living in Pleasanton. And some of them came to Livermore to make a living too. So anyway, um, so yeah, all volunteers. And now I want to introduce, this is going to be fun, especially one of them. Okay, this is um, this is Marin Hall. We're related. We're related. Her. We're related. This is Marin Hall. Her father um, had a wonderful business. It was a huge feed store. Pretty terminal. Oh, she, she had her family had a huge feed store, and we went to school. She was a year younger than me, and um, you know she'll have to tell you about how uh, her parents made a living. Now this is going to be fun. You know, this is this is Tom Orloff. Tom Orloff went from a dairyman son, grandson, to the Alameda County District Attorney. And guess who worked for him? He said I could tell tell you. Uh, way back when, when he was the district attorney, she was a prosecutor in Alameda County. Oh my Yeah. No, no, you guys gotta guess. Come on. Yeah. Paula Harris worked for Tom. I tease him. I asked him if I could introduce him that way. <laughs> and this is Anita Macias. She comes from a large family, and their family worked like heck. And she said to me when I called her, Donna, I don't really have a story. Talk to my husband, Walt McLeod, who was the police chief. And I said, no, no, Anita. I knew her. I knew the family. And I said, tell me about your day. And then she proceeded to tell me about how she worked, her whole family worked. 
from morning and then after school, etc. And I said, you know, kids nowadays need to hear your story. And then she went on to, she did, said she didn't want to harvest tomatoes for the rest of her life. <laughs> and so she, she opened up an accounting uh, company in Pleasanton. And this is Tim Copeland. Tim Copeland uh, used to be a little boy coming to our planet. <laughs> okay, Tim Copeland's family had been in the ranching business. And we had brandings just like he did. And the man that always did the castrations was his grandfather. Great uncle. Great uncle. Okay. And Tom, he's younger than I am, he would be walking right along behind him, you know, and then he, they'd be carrying a white bucket, and they would take it home with him. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Okay. And, and this is Carolyn Cardinale. Uh, Antonina Cardinale. We went from kindergarten through high school together. Um, she's been here forever. They had property in Livermore, and, and her dad did, like you know, business uh, in Livermore. So there you go. Okay. Now, I would say, what about 12 minutes each? 15, but you can go on. No, <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Baron Hall, and I grew up in Pleasanton in the same home that my dad lived in. Uh, both sides of my family, um, here's my dad, there's my mom, up at Casper, we always went up there for Easter egg hunts. Hold the, hold the, hold the. Oh, Tom Warlock. <laughs> anyway, I want to show you my grandparents. Uh, there's the, that was on 1st Street, that's on Main Street, but it used to be attached to Axe. So, so after, <laughs> okay, if, if they could hold the thing, okay. The hay went in. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Anyway, those are my great-grandparents who uh, settled in Dublin, the Rasmussen family, and my mother, my mother's mother was a daughter of them, and they lived in where the museum is today on Main Street. That was their home. And he rented different ranches. In fact, my grandmother was born out on Collier Canyon Road, up from the from the um, Costco, you know, on a ranch. That was one of the ranches he rented. And the story of how he and my grandmother Wilhelmina met. It's very interesting. It's in the story, but I don't have time to help tell you. But if you have the book, um, it talks about their 50th wedding anniversary and that the King of Denmark sent them um, a goodwill wishes. Also, the mayor of San Francisco sent them that. So anyway, back to um, how I grew up. So my mother was a Rasmussen, and. My dad was visiting my grandmother. And now, he, my grandmother, when she got married to Anders Anderson, Anderson with an S, she met him before he took off for the Alaska Gold Rush. And she kept writing him. So he came back and he had this gold from the Alaska Gold Rush made into a ring. And because I'm named after my grandmother, which is really pronounced Marn. She gave it to me, uh, or, you know, instead of the other cousins, which they're kind of jealous about, but that's okay. <laughs> so, um, they got married, I think in 1901, and he ranched a house across the road from my great-grandparents, from his in-laws, in Dublin, um, on the road. I think there's the water, uh, they kept the water uh, tower they had to take down the house, but the water tower is there with a monument to Wilhelmina and Peter Rasmussen. Um, he finally left Dublin and he bought the homes. You know Home Street? Yeah. He bought their house and the address was 117 South S Street, which is where the entrance of the um, hospital is. That was their home. And so I grew up just knowing that home, growing up there. 
And um, so um, I'll go back to that after, because I have kind of a lot of stories about Livermore as well as Pleasanton. I want to go back to my dad. He had a mill that he used to clean the grain from the farmers here, and also he pressed the oats so that the horses at the race track could digest the oats better. They would be smashed so you could see the white grain in it. And that was all in here, and it's on First Street. There's now a gas station there. It's on the corner of, uh, is it Ray Street and First Street? And his, his dad and his uncle, E.E. E. Hall, who brought the fairgrounds to Pleasanton, their names are on a plaque, Fred Hall and Ernest Hall, own uh, from here all the way down to um, the Pleasanton Elementary was all their warehouses. But during the Depression, my grandfather went busted and my grand, the bank called up my dad and said, hey boo, why don't you uh, buy one of the warehouses? And he says, well, I need a retail too. Well, the Aarons, which were another old family in Pleasanton, had that place on Main Street, this place, which is still there. And he says, well, I'll give you a good price if you'll take that off our hands. So that's why they're the two, one on First Street and one on Neal and Main. It's 450 Main. I think it's a title company now but it was a furniture store and, and all that. And so when they remodeled it, because it had to be earthquake proof, they tore down the park, this part where the hay was, and now you can drive in the back there. But that was originally attached to Hamps, Hamps Restaurant. That's the part that's attached, okay. Um, my dad was quite a merchant. He worked seven days a week. Um, finally, he gave up. Um, Sunday he would have to sweep and clean because he was open six days a week to the public from eight to five and then I remember when he was much older than my mom and I was the youngest so he, my mom says well now we can do some things in the afternoon because your father's going to only he's going to close the store on at noon on Saturdays and then eventually he because um, the farmers would come in Tom's dad and Tom would come in and they'd all get their feet and sit and talk with my dad. That Saturdays was the time the farmers came from the hills here and come down and get their grains and stuff. So there's my dad with my dog Bootsy near the cash register. And that's my sister and me, we were little. And so we lived in my dad's home on Neal Street and it's still there. It's right across from the convalescent hospital, 215. So, um, I was little, as you can see, and so when I came home from kindergarten, now there were no, there wasn't a lot of traffic, there were no stoplights or anything. I used to walk home, my mother would have a little sandwich ready for me in the refrigerator, I was in the morning class. That's the times they had two sessions of kindergartners, and um, I would walk down with the dog and then take my nap on the sacks. And uh, I liked it when they had just brought them in from the warehouse, the one on First Street, because they'd be warm from rolling the oats, and, you know, after they were smashed. The best ones were the rabbit pellets because they didn't scratch me like the burlap bag. They were in white. So uh, my dad had a monkey in the store. I don't see the store window, is it there? No. Okay. I thought there was a one of the store window. There. He had a, we had a m monkey named Chico. Donald loves his story. And my dad set up a thing so people would be standing on the corner of Neil. This is Neil and this is Maine. Uh, watching this monkey swing from window to window. <laughs> and then at night he'd bring him home and um, he'd be in our yard or in a cage and my dad would take him back down to the store. You can see where it says B.H. Hall Company. It was feed and grain. And then my parents, before they retired, had that all sandblasted. Those who grew up in the 50s and 60s, it was painted white. And now it's sandblasted with the original brick. 
So, okay. So these uh, people um, were my great grandparents and their daughter, and they had um, my grandmother and her sister, Wilhelmina's sister, was Donna's great grandmother. So that's how I'm related to Donna. They told her to come come to um, Ca California from Denmark. And so Sine, that was the sister of Wilhelmina, came and she married a camp. And so that's how we're related. So it's really, when we started doing this book, it was just like eye-opening. So every Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, Christmas Eve, and of course my grandmother and grandfather's birthdays, we would come to Livermore to be at their house. I don't know if you remember, it caught on fire and it became a Lions restaurant. And then they, Lions moved out and now it's Valley Memorial Hospital. But the hospital, the original one in 1964, was around the corner, I think, where Lifestyles is. And um, my grandfather, when uh, he he wanted to sell it after my after he died, my mom and her brothers and sisters uh, sold that to H. J. Kaiser. You remember the Kaiser gravel pit yeah. near Pleasanton? Yeah. Well, every Christmas they had a huge redwood tree decorated with lights. Do you remember that? Those were here. And that was the first treat of Christmas Eve. We knew that we we're going to our grandmother's house when we saw that great big Christmas tree. And then I think it was Lone Star on the right side of the road, as we went up to Livermore, had a smaller tree. So we were just delighted, and then we'd have Christmas, see all our cousins, they came from the city, and it was a really a joyous time for us here in Livermore. I don't know if some of you remember Bogman's. We had Doherty's in Pleasanton, and sometimes my mother would buy our clothes for school at Bogman's, it was on First Street. And of course you had Dom's, um, uh, what do you call that? Outfitters, right. You had that on the corner, and there was a place that sold cars where my mother got her last Continental. What was that? Was it Ford? Ford car? Gross Brothers. Gross Brothers, that was it. And then Bogman's was on down on the left hand side. So we had the Vine Theater, that was our entertainment. Kind of kitty corner was Froster's Freeze. We had to have our ice cream. And couple streets over, we had Lord's Ice Cream. I don't know if you remember, I think they still are there. Okay, so, um, you know, Livermore was a treat. And um, so uh, my cousins, I have a, a group of cousins from um, the Andersons, as of my, my mom's youngest brother. They all went to Granada. They lived here in Livermore. And my, because my uncle was the youngest he had may nissen i don't know if you know that name she was a very famous well-known teacher here in livermore and he used to talk about his favorite teacher may nissen in fact before amador was built livermore high school was built and my dad's older brother ernie graduated from livermore high school and i have the shape the actual sheepskin diploma from there, and I'd like to donate it, I don't know, uh, to um, whatever you have for a museum here. I thought they might like that. Uh, um, okay, that's on 4th, isn't it? Okay, well, they're going to get it, and anything else. I have Livermore Rodeo tickets I found that my dad was selling, brand new, was in a box uh, from 1946. That's before I was born, and I thought they might like those, and there's a lot of different heirlooms I'm trying to distribute now that I'm going through my parents' thing. Um, so, does anybody have any questions? Um, we can take questions at the end. Oh, take questions at the end. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
what happens when you're 81 years old and you sit down for a while. <laughs> 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 Well, as was said, uh, Kamala Harris did used to work for me for, for about six years, and you can have people can have whatever opinion they want, but I, I would vouch for the fact that she was a very effective trial prosecutor, and uh, she did a good job for Alameda County when she was with us. So, um, anyway, Livermore and Pleasanton always had a a real rival. And I was sometimes conflicted because I was born in Livermore at uh, St. Paul's Hospital, which was which was the only hospital in the valley. So we were in the hospital was at St. Paul's. So every time I had to put down where I was born, I really wanted to put Pleasant. <laughs> but then I thought, no, and they may have some records, and so I, 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 would, put, I would put down in Livermore. My mother uh, was born in Livermore on a ranch just north, uh, and her father was a Danish immigrant named Julius Jensen, and he was her mother was actually first generation or second generation, I guess, but her parents were from Denmark. Her parents were from Denmark. Can you hear it now? Her parents were from, my grandmother's parents were from Denmark, so I ended up with 100% Danish, and I'll tell you about the Pleasanton part of it. But we used to go out, uh, take Sunday rides, because I had aunts that lived uh, out in Tassajara, and sometimes we'd stop at the, the, the ranch that my grandfather had. And uh, it was a fairly small operation, uh, milk probably about, 20 to 30 cows. I remember he had a, uh, they churned their own butter. Uh, they also raised some grain and, uh, and hay. And it was, uh, it was a small, just immigrant people farm. They, uh, I remember one time I was out there, I was probably about 12 or 13. Now, if there's some real animal lovers here, I'm gonna get in trouble, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a bow and arrow, and uh, I had these, I made a, a couple of these special arrows called flukus, where you wind the feathers around it instead of having them in a line to make it. So you, when you shot the arrow, it would get more air, and you, so you could shoot up into a tree or something, and you could go retrieve your arrow because it didn't go that far. So I was going to go out bird hunting, everybody else was in the house. And they all laughed at me. Actually, I shot a bird. I hit it. I surprised the heck out of myself. Uh, they wouldn't believe me. They came out and looked at it, and there was a bird with an arrow through it. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was a different time. That's what kids. That's what kids did. But getting, I was always really closer to my Pleasanton family because that's where I lived, and my grandparents lived right across the street. Uh, from us, and, and my grandfather had a dairy. He was a Danish immigrant, came over from Denmark in about 1890s. Uh, and while he was here, where is he? There's my grandfather. What's the big one? The big one, the one on your left is my grandfather and the one on your right is my father. Uh, my grandfather came over, and while he was here, he met, in the United States, he met a Danish woman who was also in this country, basically, I think what you would call now, uh, acting as, or working as an au pair. And they met, and they decided to go back to Denmark they did, they got married, and my oldest aunt was born in Denmark. Then they came back to the United States around, I don't know, 1902, or somewhere around there. And my grandfather uh, eventually started farming in Dublin. 
and there was a place called the Two County Ranch, which was up at the end of Alcosta Boulevard. There used to be a carpenter's training thing there. I don't know if it's still there. So he farmed there. That's where my dad was born in 1910. And in 1920, my grandfather had saved enough that uh, he was able to buy, uh, put in a down payment on a dairy in Pleasanton. And then the family moved into Pleasanton out of Dublin. Uh, my grandfather was very active in civic affairs. He served as uh, mayor of Pleasanton. He uh, was the foreman of the Alameda County Grand Jury one year when Earl Warren was the district attorney of Alameda County. And I have one of my prized possessions is an indictment that was turned returned by the grand jury indictment as a charging document, charging individuals with a crime. And there was two signatures on it, the foreman of the grand jury and Earl Warren. So I have that, I have it framed. Uh, and my grandfather's name was Thomas Jensen Orloff and I was named after him. And that's one of my, my prized possessions. But on the dairy, you know, the dairy business, 365 days a year, twice a day, cows don't take days off. Uh, and, and my father's story is, is kind of interesting, I'll, I'll do it quickly. He uh, went up to Davis to college in 19, I guess it would have been 27 or so, and depression hit and he had to drop out right away and he was running a dairy for my grandfather my grandfather was uh, running in uh, Newark and the 365 days a year uh, twice a day he was a young guy 19 years old and it got him and he came down with tuberculosis uh, which in my opinion he never fully recovered from although he was an active, uh, active man, but he died at age uh, 63. Uh, uh, another thing in Livermore, which I never mentioned any of these, is uh, shortly before he passed away, in 1973, I'd been in the DA's office for three years, and I really enjoyed the work. And he and I were sitting there talking kind of about what I would be doing in the, in the future uh, because I'd originally planned to come back to Pleasanton and practice law, but I really enjoyed the work in the DA's office. You know, I don't know, I'm sitting at uh, Valley Memorial, the old one, and I'm sitting on a radiator there, and he's in the, in the bed, and uh, we're talking, and I said to him, Pop, Someday I'm going to be district attorney of Alameda County. <laughs> and through the tough times, sometimes when things weren't going right or for whatever reason, there were a lot of things I could talk about. But that's what kept me going. Because I made that promise to my dad. They were so good to me. They supported me. They taught me. They taught me the values of hard work. They taught me the, the, the values of what's right. And, and they taught me also a, a certain degree of you know, you're who you are and you should be confident in who you are. And uh, I owe that all to them and the whole community of Pleasanton that supported that ethos back then. So anyway, there's, now this one, I don't know if you can see. Oh, it's up, it's up there too. That's when I was DA with uh, Janet Reno. Uh, who was then the Attorney General in the Carter administration, and she was in uh, Alameda County visiting. Uh, below that was, uh, you recognize, <laughs> again, when I, was, when I was District Attorney, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Was he governor then? Yes, he was governor in that one. I have a picture before, with him before he was governor and he was up, which is, should have put, I should have put on that it was my, it's more informal. He was promoting some proposition that thing. 
But yeah, so it, you know, my life changed from being the uh, son of dairyman. Actually, in about 19, middle 1950s, maybe late 1950s, uh, my dad sold the dairy herd. My grandfather had passed away because Pleasanton was starting to move a little. And it was obvious that it wasn't going to be a dairy farm for that long. And he would have had to make a, a large investment to modernize it. Uh, so for, for years, he just uh, did mostly row crops. And uh, so I would run the cucumber harvest and haul the cucumbers into... Uh, Is that Valley Avenue back there with the trees? Yes. And that's actually, that's actually irrigating sugar beets in the top one. And then the bottom one is the tall skinny one in the middle is uh, when we're loading cucumbers uh, to haul into Hayward. Uh, and, and so it was, a, it, was a great, it was a great life then. And, and you, you knew everybody. And you, every place you went, you know, you behaved yourself because somebody knew your folks. And, uh, but even just, you know, when you went somewhere, you knew people. Uh, one, one, just a little thing, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. One, one little thing. Uh, Sorensen's Barbershop was on Main Street. That's where we got our haircut. There was two barbershops, and this uh, Sorensen was Dane, so we went <laughs> to, this, to uh, Sorensen's Barbershop. So one day, I'm probably, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, and I'm in to get a haircut. And I'm next in line, but there was a couple other customers. And a guy comes in, who, you know, I, I knew it was, it was Doc Cook, who was the veterinarian that treated our uh, animals on the farm. And he was in a hurry. Uh, so he offered to pay for my haircut if I'd switch places. <laughs> well, the kid's haircut was 75 cents. I, I, my, my grandsons can't believe that. <laughs> but it was 75 cents. The adults, I think, were, were uh, uh, a buck and a quarter. So anyway, I got 75 cents now, right? N next door to the barbershop is a bakery. Okay. I love the chocolate eclairs. I, I blew a whole bunch of the money on chocolate eclairs, which were eight cents a piece. I ate more than I should have, and I didn't have a chocolate eclair for a long time after that. So, I mean, it was every place you went, uh, and, and Miriam's dad and, and her mother, my mother, we did a lot of things together. Uh, and so it was, uh, it was just a nice, tight place where, you know, you knew a lot of people, they knew you. I can't think of any, any crooks. I mean, every, everybody was just, uh, you know, going about their business, working hard, supporting their family, and, uh, and it was a wonderful place. Well, I want to go back to Livermore for just a second, and this might interest um, the curator, the library guy, and the retired uh, historian from Livermore. It was something that that my, my uncle had who grew up in Livermore also, his name is Lawrence Valpone. And I brought it because I didn't know what else to do with it. I haven't had it up in my house for a long time. And at some point my kids are going to have to figure out what to do with it. So I thought, I think it's of interest and they would enjoy having it. So I'm going to go grab it.
Nokia. Yeah. 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 I just want to mention one thing about the rival because I never, you know, uh, I play basketball at Amador. And uh, Livermore was the big, big rival. And my, my junior year, Livermore had a center uh, named, I think it was Terry Daly, and the last name was Daly, who was a little taller than me, and then about 50 or 60 pounds heavier. And he used to beat the crap out of me. And they, they had another kid that was a sophomore that came off the bench, didn't play too much. Real awkward, big guy, big kid, probably 6'6", six, six then. But, but real awkward and didn't play much. Then the next year when I was a senior, and this kid was a junior, wasn't the same guy. <laughs> he was 6'8". He could, he could drive with either way. He had a nice mid-range jump shot. And his name was Erwin Mueller. I don't know if any of you probably don't remember him, but then he went and played at USF. Uh, everybody played four years then, so they played four years at USF. And then he was drafted in the second round by the Chicago Bulls and, and played for uh, several years in the NBA with some different teams. So when I say, Livermore always beat the crap out of us. Yeah. <laughs> they had the horses to do it. <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening. This is good? Oh, <laughs> good afternoon. My name is Anita Macias Conley McLeod. <laughs> uh, our family came to Pleasanton in 1946. Uh, we heard that they needed a foreman to run a ranch. My father had experience at it in Southern California. He uh, was originally from Mexico, born in Mexico, Joe Macias, and he was very colorful. He wore a mariachi outfit for the parades in Chino, which is where my mother met him. Uh, my mom was born in El Paso, Texas, and uh, but both of their parents were born in Mexico. So when we came to Pleasanton, my father ran a ranch and he, from start to finish, would see that everything got plowed, planted, and especially that we had the workers to harvest. Not only did he get the labor to do that, but they also cooked three meals a day for all of the workers. There were little cottages for the workers, and I would have to get up and help my mother turn tortillas on a wood stove. <laughs> we only had a nice box. And I used to think, gosh, I'm glad I'm a girl, because sometimes my brother would forget to chop wood at night. <laughs> and they would have to get him up super early. <laughs> and, and so that was uh, pretty much uh, the, the way we lived uh, until my father heard that you could make a lot of money picking cotton in Bakersfield. So we left for one year. That didn't work out, so they wound up cooking in a Mexican restaurant instead. But we came back to Pleasanton. And he did some work for Mr. Orloff, <laughs> besides Donna's parents and uh, Roy Cruz. And unfortunately, our little home on the ranch burned down. So we wound up moving into downtown. Uh, a gentleman uh, 
Well, he used to, he built Stanford. He was the superintendent for Stanford Hospital. And my dad was over there doing some pruning for him. And he goes, I like your work. I want you to come work for me. So he wound up doing construction the last parts of his years, as did all my brothers. They all wound up doing construction. Um, then uh, all of the boys were very athletic. My brother Joe uh, got a lot of awards in his junior year, which was unheard of, and in his senior year. I also always wanted to work, and there was Jackson's uh, Roses, and my mom worked there. And whenever there was some school time off, I would say, ask if I can come help, you know, because I always wanted to make extra money. One year, oh, <laughs> one year, Collier Magazine, Magazine decided they do, wanted to do an article on the Rose Garden. And so they took me out there to take some pictures among the roses. Well, it never published. They went bankrupt. All your smiles, he went bankrupt. So that's just the memory from that. Uh, later on, I went on to uh, open my own income tax practice, and that was my first office on First Street in Pleasanton. My daughter-in-law and son, who are here, took it over after 34 years that I was in business, and now my grandson, third generation, is still ongoing in Pleasanton, yeah. So we're really proud about that. This is uh, some of the workers at the Rose Garden. Oh. <laughs> uh, the top picture is my father on the ranch and my mother by the car. Some cousins working for Jackson's Rose Garden. Yeah, oh, it's enlarged. Oh, yeah, they're larger, got it, okay. And then uh, in high school, my brother and I would do a dance routine. It was when the cha-cha was real popular and all of those. So uh, we were always entertaining, singing, dancing, that kind of thing. And then uh, for my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, this was... My dad again, dressed as a charro, <laughs> and my mom, and uh, all of our family. They had seven children total, and they are, all but two are still with us. Two of my sisters are here. They made it as well. <laughs> and uh, so life was good, like Tom said, in Pleasanton. It was good that every, you knew everyone, but a lot of times, by the time you got home, your parents already knew where you had been and what you had been doing. <laughs> so hometown is okay sometimes. Uh, I do have to compliment uh, the city of Pleasanton. Uh, they thought a lot of my father and the little circle where they lived, they named it Macias Court after my father, so that's there for us as a memory as well. Uh, uh, I went on later on to marry Walter McLeod, who was police chief in Pleasanton. We've been married 48 years. Uh, he is also part of the book. I try to get him to come, but he's getting shy in his old, older days. But uh, anyway, uh, he loved Pleasanton, devoted a lot of time to it. As a matter of fact, he wore three hats at one time, I mean, two hats at one time. He had the police department and the fire department for three years as well. So he was a busy fellow, so I can see why nowadays he doesn't want to do very much. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you have questions. So what's your I just, where was the Rose Garden here? I'm sorry. Where uh, there was one in Pleasanton, and then uh, it was in Littlemore, I believe. It was outside. Just went off Santa Rita. Went off the Jackson, Jackson and Perkins. Yes, off of Santa Rita Road. Okay. 
Oh, that's how that house in that rose went. Okay, yeah. I only worked in the main building downtown where they used to, but yeah, where we packed them to send off roses to different parts of the country, whoever ordered. Yeah, and my mom worked there quite a few years, so. Everyone in my family was always uh, looking for work. Uh, they, my brothers worked at the cheese factory. Uh, yes, <laughs> everyone remembers the cheese factory. Mr. Balsedas was a great friend to my father. If he needed money for anything, on his word, he'd let him have it. They'd go to the bank to get the money, and the banker would say, well, don't you want to know for this money? And he said, no, his word is enough. And so he was sent that way and employed all of my brothers at one time or another when they were in high school. So uh, everyone was very injustice. And I guess I'm gonna leave questionings for later. in the 50s, 
Uh, we would sit and listen to the rain, but we'd take a bucket of bent staples, fence staples, and straighten them and save them. As children, as my, my grandfather lived through the Great Depression, my father was a child of the Great Depression, and I kind of got swept into the whole thing. But my Uncle Bull here in Livermore was straightening a staple on top of a fence post. And he hit it in one corner and it popped into his eye. But that was, that was what we remember, what I remember doing is because of the depression, the effects that it had. Uh, my German and Danish, or German and Italian side uh, came from, uh, they were immigrants to uh, Dublin. And they first landed in the 1870, something like that. Lynn's got the dates down. And their homestead was where Shannon Park is right now in Dublin. My grandfather uh, graduated from the eighth grade and had been milking some cows on his own. He had leased a dairy when he was in eighth grade, ninth, would have been ninth grade, but in his early years he was working for the family but also had secured a dairy uh, facility and was milking some of his own cows and uh, saving money didn't continue with school and in 1917 it, i've got some history from this fine woman right here she has provided me a lot of stuff but in 1917 he and his younger brother george had a dairy facility which was kind of adjacent to Orloffs and kind of adjacent to the last map I saw was a neighbor of camps. And uh, in, in uh, 1917, I just got a copy of a newspaper article where there was a tragic fire at this dairy facility, and my father, or my grandfather, and his brother George lost 750 tons of alfalfa hay and nine prime workhorses that could not be saved. Now what happened there, whether they were forced into a sale of a facility or moved out, but the next year, in 1918, on November 1st, uh, my grandfather and his brother George bought the ranch where we still live today in Sonoma. So they went from a dairy facility on the flats with irrigated ground and all that and the article in the newspaper said they had a very very highly technically developed dairy facility and milking parlor they went from that probably because of the loss of the hay and the horses which they valued then at seven thousand dollars in loss uh, they went from there, probably downsized, downgraded, downcosted, and came to the hill country where we are today. In 1918, they paid, well, I'll give you a little idea where we are. We're between Pleasanton and Sonol. We've got about a mile of I-680 frontage. And they paid $35 an acre for 900 acres. Thirty-five an acre, and they finally got it paid off in 1958. Forty-year mortgage. Finally got it paid off in 1958. We still remain there. We are now fifth and sixth generation involved in the beef cattle industry. Uh, mentioned earlier that we had. Uh, walnut orchards at one time, and my grandfather, I can remember my grandfather and my dad farming hay on a lot of those rather steep hills with teams of horses. And with tractors later on, but my grandfather never sat on a tractor in his life. I can remember as a little kid in the 50s, my grandfather still had a team of horses. Of course, his names were Fanny and Blackie. And I can remember raking hay on Pleasanton Sonoma Road, riding with my grandfather on a team with a team of horses breaking hay. But he never did get on a tractor. As a matter of fact, 
his driving was somewhat suspect as well. <laughs> I can never know. My, my grandfather and I got along really, really well. He was very, very thoughtful, very, very tolerant, uh, easy to get along with. And I can remember working alongside him as a kid. And my, he, one day he put diesel, or no, he put gasoline in the diesel truck. Doesn't work real well. The diesel truck, though, was a World War II uh, weapons carrier. Uh, you couldn't probably hurt it anyway. But my dad came down and just raised Holy Cobb with us, both of us, because I was as guilty as. And he drove off. My grandfather turned to me and he said, The hardest man I ever worked for was my son. <laughs> Go back to the farming. Uh, let's let's kind of stay with the 50s, I guess. Uh, I remember the Macias family. I remember the Orloffs. I remember Mel Nelson. I remember Cruises. I remember Kennedys. All raising row crops uh, throughout the, the Livermore Amador Valley, particularly the area in Pleasanton there. And one of the things that we used to do uh, with with cattle is we would graze aftermath. We would graze beet tops. Tom earlier mentioned sugar beets. Well, sugar beets used to be grown quite a bit in the valley floor there. And I can remember as a little kid in the 50s having to go in the 1955 GMC pickup twice a day to go from the ranch of Sonoma to the farm fields to check the cows. Because the sugar beets, they take you the tops off. And the tops were really good feed. It was great forage and you're grazing an aftermath and you're you know, using something right. But there was always going to be some sugar beets, some whole sugar beets that got left through the harvest process. Cows are not known for being extremely intelligent. They're food based. <laughs> They're food based. So they would come upon a sugar beet and they would try to eat the sugar beet. Well, sugar beets can be pretty big, and cow throats can be pretty small. So we'd have to go twice a day. We would put a rope on a, on a cow that maybe was <laughs> tie it to the bumper of the truck, and then take a stick and push it all the way down. Hey, they're a four-chambered stomach. They can handle it once it was in the right hole. <laughs> The, uh, it's been mentioned. It's been mentioned several times here today, also uh, about how how nice it was uh, in Pleasanton during the fifties and growing up in the sixties and all that. And everybody knew everybody else, and it was really kind of neat. Uh, I can remember there used to be a store, Pete Christensen had the store, and for years it was the Christensen store. Pete Christensen was in the horse race business, in the horse training business, and had a, a stable set up on his house, by his house. We even have a pond on the, on the ranch right now called the Christensen Pond, because his horse deal came right up to the edge of our fence. Uh, he had the store there for years, and I can remember as a little kid saving all my birthday money. I had eleven dollars. I went into Christensen's one cold winter day, and I was going to buy a damn cowboy hat. <laughs> eleven dollars, what that cowboy hat cost me. So if we went from there with a load of hay to go feed cows in winter time, cold, windy. <laughs> Yeah, you guys are seeing it. <laughs> I had the hat for probably an hour and a half. <laughs> and I never did find it, ever. <laughs> it blew off. My dad never wore a cowboy hat. He wore a baseball cap all the time. He turned to me and he goes, see why I wear caps? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the way it was. Uh, the pictures we've got mostly uh, are fairly modern pictures and they're mostly of me and my family and 
Because we look through and look through and look through and, and really nothing much got saved as far as family operations. The two pictures that stick most of my mind are the pictures of my dad in his Navy uniform. Like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of young men in 1941-42, he enlisted in the military to serve in World War II. And there are pictures there, my dad, my grandfather, my dad, my grandmother, when he was ready to ship out. He served on the PT boat, the Pacific Theater. Uh, had some harrowing stories, but we didn't hear them from him. And I know Donna's father had some harrowing experiences as a pilot in World War II. But my dad took great pride in his service in World War II, but didn't really talk about it too much. So those are, that old barn is still standing, by the way. It's one of the few barns I've ever seen with a culvert, with a creek that runs underneath the, the foundation of the barn. And people have come to me and said, well, why would you have a creek run underneath the foundation? Uh, was at the time before the EPA it was an easy way to dispose of manure. <laughs> we could not get away with that today. So, all right, that's about my time, I think. Now comes cousin number two. <laughs> done one of these before, so you just didn't have to bear with me. Um, anyway, both my parents are from Pleasanton and Livermore. My mom was from Pleasanton, my dad was from Livermore. And uh, my father's family, uh, my grandfather came to Livermore. I think there were some relatives around here. I think it was like 1906, maybe. Um, and then he went back married my grandmother, and came back. And um, my father actually was born on um, Pleasant, uh, the road to Livermore, Stanley Boulevard. There was a little house there. I think there was, it was um, a, um, a lumber company for a while. And that's where my father was born, because they were there. Um, OK, I'm, I'm on. Um, anyway, and so uh, they, he eventually settled out in Livermore, um, brought his bride out to, uh, bought a ranch out on the Mines Road. And we still have the ranch. In fact, um, <laughs> Tim's daughter lives out there. <laughs> Tim and Melinda's daughter lives out there. So we have cousins that actually live out on, on the family home. Um, anyway, so um, the, um, he, um, he grew up on the ranch out on the Mines Road in Livermore, went to the Livermore schools. And uh, actually when he started um, working, and he, you know, he graduated from high school, um, he actually was a produce manager at Hextrum's grocery store. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Um, oh, okay, I think we all remember that. It's actually where the, or, uh, where, the, uh, where the hardware store is now, downtown. And it was Hackstrom's grocery store, and, um, and he was the produce manager. And there, of course, Louis Hewitson was the butcher. So they were very good friends, very close. And uh, then somebody approached him. Um, I, th I think it was after he was married to my mom. Some, somewhere along the line, someone approached him and said, well, you know, it's good that you're working at the store, but, you know, have you ever thought about going into insurance? And in the 
the, in the town in Pleasanton, this is Pleasanton, um, I don't think there were any other insurance agents. There might have been, Johnny Amaral might have had some insurance at that time, uh, but other than that, there were no other insurance agents. So I don't know if Annis had it yet. Um, but anyway, uh, so he decided that he was going to go into insurance, state farm insurance, and that's what he did. So maybe some of you remember, my dad had a, an office in Livermore and in Pleasanton for state farm insurance. And he went to insurance and, and did quite well at state farm insurance. My mom was, um, well, my dad lived in Livermore and they're out on the ranch, lived out on the ranch and they did all the things, you raised cattle and everything else out on the ranch. Uh, my mom lived in Pleasanton, and uh, her uh, parents were divorced, which was very unusual at the you know time. And uh, so she grew up with my uh, great grandmother and her daughters. There were four daughters, and uh, my grandmother was one of the daughters. And so. Uh, they lived in Pleasanton, kind of where, well, it would be um, kind of where Del, Delval Parkway is. And it's kind of to the, if you're going towards town, it would be to the right. It was the old Simmons property. It was kind of by the trestle there. And the, there was a house there. And it was uh, my, my grandmother's house, uh, great-grandmother's house. And then my grandmother was there, lived there also. And then... Um, Anyway, so I can remember going there, you know, as a child to this house that was near the trestle. And, and I can remember in the backyard they had actually a little water pump, you know, that you would pump the water from there. And I just loved that. That was, that was a big, big deal to me. Um, but anyway, so um, my mom was brought up there. And uh, she went to Amador High School, and, you know, to um, elementary school. And uh, let me think here. <laughs> um, anyway, um, she was, my mom loved to dance and sing. That was her thing. I mean, so if anybody knows me, I'm a singer, you know, not a dancer. You don't want to see me dance. Um, anyway, so she, uh, she met my dad. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how they met. I guess at dances. They used to have dances in town uh, during that time, I guess World War II time. Um, anyway, um, so they um, got together and married. Um, trying to think what else here. <laughs> I, should have, I should have written notes like Anita here. Um, <laughs> um, my dad, um, Came, became the state farm insurance agent. And uh, my mom was pretty much a stay-at-home mom, but before that, uh, she worked at the telephone company downtown. It was a telephone company. She was an operator, you know, where you put the little, little things in, you know, like you see in the movies. And that's what she did. Um, and, uh, let's see. <laughs> what else do you want to know about? What well, my mother's maiden name was Doris Grana. We actually, my great grandmother came over here. They were the Roboli family. So if you know Roboli Street, there's a Roboli Street I think out in Ruby Hill. And anyway, the Roboli Winery, all that. It's it's all the Roboli family. So, but she was married to a man named Peter Grana, and they divorced. Um, my grandmother and. Uh, and her husband divorced, and my mom was an only child. Um, my, um, so what did you say, Donna? <laughs> what, what was life like? Oh, what was life like? In the 50s, you know, of course, I was, you know, in elementary school, pretty much in the 50s. The 60s, um, Pleasanton was a small town. You know, you could go downtown with friends and never worry about anybody bothering you. I remember my cousin and I, who lived in San Francisco, she'd come out, stay with her grandmother uh, out in Pleasanton during the summer, and we'd walk down to the fair, we'd go downtown, we'd get a Coke, we, you know, nobody bothered us. You know, when we were, you know, little kids, I mean, not real little, but 
we were middle school anyway, and uh, nobody bothered us. It was it was calm. It was um, it was friendly, and everybody knew everybody else. I mean, just like they were saying. I mean, you know, if you did something wrong, um, I mean, your parents knew about it before you got home from school that day, because it was all over town. Um, so. Uh, we lived on Ray Street. We didn't live in the big green, there's a big greenhouse on Ray Street, right, kind of Ray and Main Street. Um, and that my dad built later on, but we lived next door in the little house, 312 Ray Street, that's where I was born. I mean, I was born in Livermore at the hospital at, at St. Paul's, but, uh, but basically that's where I lived until I was like nine or 10 years old. And then my dad built the bigger green ranch style home uh, and then we lived there, I was, you know, junior high and high school. So, uh, yes, we still lived on Ray Street, and uh, we still own the properties and uh, maintain them. Um, let's see, let me think what else. Uh, what year did you graduate from Amador? I graduated in 1966 from Amador. We'll be all trying to figure out when I graduate. <laughs> Um, I'm Donna's, Donna and I are the same age, so we grew up together, and we were childhood friends. I mean, Donna and I, I, I remember, in fact, I fell down her tank house stairs one time. <laughs> I think I still have some suffering from that, Donna. Uh, and uh, Tooney Hansen lived across the street, and so, and the Orloffs, right? Um, yeah, the Orloffs are next door, we're next door, and uh, so uh, we grew up together and went all this, to school together and, you know, had fun as kids. Um, trying to think more about what my mom and dad did. Um, my mom was kind of, she was kind of like the cool mom. So uh, she'd drive all the kids around, you know, I can remember. I mean, like my brother is two years older than I am. And I remember the boys would get into the car with my mom and they'd say, well, let's cruise by so-and-so's house, you know, some girl that they liked. And so they, my mom would take them cruising by the girl's house, you know, and all that stuff. I won't tell you what they were kind of wondering if she was, she was, if she was changing near the window. But anyway, uh, <laughs> and I won't mention the girl. But um, anyway, so yeah, she was, she would, take the kids around and took us a lot of different places. And, uh, you know, it was just fun. Pleasanton was, was simple and easy. Uh, it was not, um, I mean, you knew everybody in town and everybody knew you. It, it was, uh, like I said, you couldn't do anything wrong because your parents knew it before you got home. Um, I remember one time I think I had tried smoking a cigarette at the bowling alley. Oh my goodness, my mom knew that before I even got home from it. You know, and so it is, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know <laughs> what else would you like to know. Okay. So let's, let's hear for a few questions for our panel. Donna, can you see the, pic the last picture, if I think those are? Um, oh, that's, that's my brother and I. Yeah. Well, I can't see the rest of the picture. Oh, I met your mom and dad at their wedding. wedding. Oh, wedding picture. Okay, I didn't look up the pictures. Um, yeah, my mom and dad's wedding picture. And my graduation, it was, uh, he was college. That's her college graduation picture. Um, we had uh, over to the left there, uh, the, the man that's to the left. There's my dad, there's a, a, um, an Asian man to the left, and my dad, me, my mom, my brother, and my great aunt. Um, the person to the left was named Paul Ung, and Paul uh, was a foreign exchange student that my parents uh, hosted for a year and uh, so and he came back to go to St. Mary's and my parents helped him actually through school and uh, 
And Paul remained, you know, very f close to our family. He was from Malaysia, and unfortunately he passed away, um, so he's no longer with us. But that's who the other person is. So he was really part of the family. Um, I think there's a picture of my parents' wedding picture and my brother and I when we were, um, yeah, my brother and I, I think I was like, I don't know, six or seven, my brother was a couple of years older, and, uh, and my parents' wedding picture. And then if you go up uh, farther, my, my grandmother, my mother's mother is to the left, Frances Grana. And she actually used to work downtown at, um, I'm trying to think of the, the clothing store she used to work at. No, no, um, no, 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 way before that. But anyway, no, well, seamstress, yeah, Mrs. Brewer was a straight seamstress, but she didn't work there. Um, Anyway, in the, on the right are my grandparents, my father's parents. And the, uh, I mean, they look like two little old Italian people, which they were. And uh, uh, they lived out on the ranch on the Mines Road in Livermore. And then up on top, uh, well, now that was, on the left was my great-grandparents, my great-grandmother and grandfather, and three of the uh, girls, my great aunts, but my grandmother was not in the picture yet because she was pregnant with her. So, uh, and then on the right hand side was my great grandmother, uh, Carolina, which I'm named after, uh, Raboli. And then Raboli, he, in fact, her husband used to work in the brickyards. I think there were brickyards around this area. And he was killed in the brickyards. And then she remarried a man named DeLuki. So uh, my, I, have a great, I had a great aunt, Virginia DeLuki. And, uh, so then she had kind of a second family. Uh, John DeLuki was police chief here at one time. And that's, it was the second family of my great grandmother. Um, so those are the pictures. OK. Now, uh, does anyone uh, have a story for us or have any questions for this panel? Um, Tom or Tim or Marin? Um, does anyone, okay, let me ask you this. Do any of you have similar experiences in Livermore uh, the way it was way back then, too? I know Livermore was very similar to Pleasanton, and we were so tied together. Uh, you can see. Oh, yes. Oh. Sure, George. <laughs> this, is, um, this is George Withers. He was the Pleasanton, Livermore Pleasanton Fire Department Chief. What years, George? Chief of 89 to 97. 89 to 97. And his car is the one that's out there. It's hot rod. <coughs> As, as I said earlier, I grew up in Livermore. Many of my dad works at the lab. And it was a different time. And, and I used to have people that, I used to ride, especially summer vacation, I used to ride around on my bicycle with a 22 rifle or a 12 rear shit gun across the handlebars. Try doing that today. <laughs> <laughs> and the Ryan Gun Club used to be out on East Avenue. So I went out there with a friend. And we shot a pan we had, and it was hot. I walked across the street to the lab gate, carrying our rifles, and called my dad, could you come and pick us up? He did. He was furious. You walked up to that guard gate carrying your rifles? Yeah, the guy said, no, but what can I do for you? <laughs> so, I don't know how that works today, but uh, it was a great time. Uh, I went to love more. I enjoyed it. And I wasn't a sort of scholar student, but I got through with better than C average and had a wonderful time. My grandkids whined about school and how tough it was. And, you know, what do you do? 
Anyway, they're both doing fine, but I couldn't bring home home once they hated going to high school. And I did. And we had a great time. Um, the roadster I went, <clears throat> I had about 25 years ago. Roadster. Roadster. Yeah. So the, the road stuff from I built myself 25 years ago, and this past year was the 100th anniversary of Amador High School. My wife went to Amador, I went to Livermore, and so she says, she said for the parade, I want to get a sign made up that says three generations of Amador grads, and put it on the side of the car. Fine. So I go to Fast Signs and they come, and I had it. <coughs> Three generations of immigrants and a cowboy at the bottom because I was an immigrant. Anyway, she tolerated it. <laughs> um, I met Carol. We, I've always been involved in cars since I started driving, even before. And actually, my first job was working on a cattle ranch at uh, Crowhairs. All of the old Vienna Ranch. One of my jobs would be in the back of this 49 Cedar Acre Vienna, throwing flakes of hay out. <laughs> anyway, and then I went to the, one of the brandy nut cutting ceremonies and um, had my first beer. <laughs> 15. And I didn't have any fall. I didn't actually care for it. So, uh, anyway, um, one day because I was involved in cars and drag racing, we always went to Fremont Drag Show. I don't know if anybody else ever went there, but yeah. it was the place to go in this area on the weekends. So, we're my, a friend of mine, he were in his convertible, and we go to Fremont Drag Show, run over home, hey, let's cruise through Pleasant, and that's what we did. We cruised from Fisher, not Fisher, but uh, Foster Freeze, or a and w in Livermore, back and forth, and then you go over to Pleasant and go from Fishers down to the corner and gain 90s and come back. So anyway, we're coming back from Fremont, so let's, let's go ahead and cruise through Pleasant, okay. So we go by, and these two girls are walking on the sidewalk. And so we wave, and they wave, we make the U-turn at gain 90 come back, and all of a sudden they're on the other side of the street. And we wave, they wave, going down again, and it happened the third time, so we come back, they're back in front of the, uh, cut, uh, I said Carter's cheese sort of the cheese factory. And um, so we pulled over and asked my wife, I said, would you go back to the ride here? Back at the convertible was wide open. Yeah, sure. Okay, we'll give you a ride home. Okay, so we're getting car. <laughs> I said, where do you live? She said, across the railroad tracks and first street to the right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yesterday was our 61st anniversary. Oh, and we did it two or three years before. It's been a lot longer than the it was on me. But uh, it's, it's amazing that we've gotten that far. We're still good friends. So, uh, anyway, uh, that's all I think I'm about to top my head. And it was a good time. Thank you. Okay, does anyone have any questions? No? Yes? Uh, any similarity, uh, any similar experiences? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Okay, I really appreciate it. And we, as you can hear, we were so connected, all of us, uh, even in Dublin too. So thank you very much.